Good afternoon, everybody. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Fatima Sierra Vargas, a CHCI Wells Fargo Housing Graduate Fellow. I'm delighted to be with, here with you today for this Latino homeownership session. As a Latina who grew up in low-income ho housing, I witnessed firsthand the barriers my parents faced to accessing homeownership. Housing impacts nearly every aspect of people's lives, such as access to employment opportunities, quality education, and quality health services. Having a home allows families to create strong social, economic, and cultural opportunities in their community. Homeownership is a tool for building wealth, and it is often people's most significant investment and valuable asset. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank the American Bankers Association and the National Association of Realtors for their generous support on this session. The chair for this panel is Representative Juan Vargas. Representative Vargas is currently voting, but will be joining us for some closing remarks later this afternoon. I will share a bit of Representative Vargas. Representative Vargas represents California's 51st Congressional District, including Imperial County and southern portions of San Diego County. He was the first elected to United States Congress in 2012 after serving in the California State Senate and the San Diego City Council. Currently serving his fourth term in Congress, Representative Vargas serves on the Committee on Financial Services and the Committee on Foreign Affairs. With that being said, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Norena Limon. Norena is the Executive Vice President of Public Policy and Industry Relations at the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, also known as NAREP. At NAREP, Norena leads the organization's policy and advocacy efforts, as well as the Hispanic Wealth Project. Prior to joining NAREP, Norena spent six years at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, both in the Office of the Director and the Office of Mortgage Markets. Before that, she, she served in the Office of Political Affairs at the White House. Norena is also a proud CHCI alumna. Please welcome Norena Limon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fatima, and thank you so much to CHCI for hosting this important conversation that I think is all of our favorite conversation. So anytime that we get to, to get together among friends and talk about this enormous issue, particularly for our community, is a good day for all of us. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, like Fatima said, uh, Congressman Vargas is going to be, uh, is voting right now. He is going to be giving closing remarks at the end of our session. Uh, and we are going to do, I'm going to ask the panelists a couple of questions, and then after we're done with the questions, uh, we're going to ask all of you to, to engage in some Q&A, and uh, we'll pass around a mic so we can really get to the bottom of how we can all be agents for change in this very, very important topic. So first of all, Fatima talked about the enormous multiplier effect that homeownership can have. Homeownership has been proven to in increase health outcomes, to increase educational outcomes, safety, stability, uh, and before anything else, homeownership has, is, is one of the most, if not the most, critical tools for bridging the wealth gap and creating wealth. So we just, the, the NARB just released a report uh, in March that outlined that Latino homeowners have 28 times the wealth as Latino renters. So if we break that down, that means that a typical household that is a, that is a homeowner has about 170,000 in household wealth. That's compared to 6,000 in, in, uh, for a family or a household that rents their home. And if we look, look at the context of the wealth gap, there is a $150,000 wealth gap between Latinos and the non-Hispanic white population. So that's home ownership right there. That is the way that regular working class families have been able to build wealth through generations. It's the way that my dad, who had a tree trimming business, was able to buy their home and buy our home and, and, and build wealth through generations uh, and create the wealth that we have in our families. And it's the way that it's been done for generations. The problem is that Latinos currently are being priced out of home ownership. I know that any of you that are in uh, the current market, whether you're renting or you're looking for a home uh, or you're homeowners right now, yay, you've uh, experienced enormous amount of equity growth. But for those of you who are starting into your road of wealth creation, things have gotten tough. I mean, we might actually say that the past two years were some of the most hostile 
uh, markets for the most hostile market for first-time home buyers, particularly those that don't rely on generational wealth in order to, be, to, to become homeowners. So if we look at the fact that because of demographics, so Latinos, the median age of Latinos is about 30, that's considered prime home buying years. So if you look at demographics alone, Latinos are, are predicted to account for 70% of new homeowners over the next 20 years. That means that Latinos are supposed to carry the real estate market for us to have a healthy economy for the foreseeable future, but we need to address these issues. So in order to level set, uh, the Latino homeownership rate is currently 48.4. There's been a consecutive increase for the past seven years, but the majority of Latinos are still renters. So let's get a little bit under this, th this issue and uh, introduce the rest of our panelists right here, my esteemed friends. I want to welcome Laura Arce, who is the Senior Vice President for Economic Initiatives at Unidos US. Uh, Laura joined Unidos in 2022, just joined to develop, launch, and lead the exciting Latino Home Ownership Initiative. Uh, this is a multi-year priority to build Latino wealth by reshaping the home ownership landscape with the goal of increasing the Latino home ownership rate to 60% by 2030. Who's excited by that, by the way? Because I am. I am pumped. <laughs> So prior to joining Unidos, Laura was the Senior Vice President for Public Policy at Wells Fargo and Senior Policy Analyst at the Federal Housing Finance Agency, commonly known as FHFA here in DC, where she oversaw reforms to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac mortgage servicing policies and products during the Great Recession. So thank you so much, Laura. And next, I wanna welcome my friend, Brian Green. Uh, Brian is Vice President of Policy Advocacy at the National Association of Realtors, where he oversees all legislative and regulatory advocacy on behalf of the association's 1.5 million members. He previously served as NAR's first director of Fair Housing Policy. Prior to joining NAR, Brian served for three decades at the U.S. Department of, of Housing and Urban Development at HUD, uh, including 10 years as the General Deputy Assistant Secretary of HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, where he oversaw the policy direction and operational management of the 600-person office uh, enforcing the nation's housing anti-discrimination law. So thank you so much, Brian. And next, I want to welcome my co-CHCI alum, by the way, Rodrigo Alba, who is the Senior Vice President and Senior Regulatory Counsel at the American Bankers, Associ Bankers Association's Regulatory Compliance and Policy Division. That is a mouthful. How do you say that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> He is responsible for oversight of residential real estate lending laws, regulations, and other legal departments. Prior to ABA, he served as legislative counsel and director of government affairs at the Mortgage Bankers Association and senior counsel at, the, at HUD. And like I said, he is a proud alumni. And finally, I want to welcome Eileen Fitzgerald, who is the head of housing affordability philanthropy with Wells Fargo. She joins Wells Fargo in 2019 after a 25 year career in the community development, nonprofit, and housing industry. In 2019, Wells Fargo unveiled an evolution to its philanthropy strategy, including a commitment of $1 billion through 2025 to address the U.S. housing affordability crisis, which we'll be talking lots about today. But prior to joining Wells Fargo, Eileen served as president and chief executive office at Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future. She has also held senior positions with NeighborWorks, uh, uh, with Fannie Mae Foundation, the AFL-CIO Housing Investment Trust, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Housing Service. So welcome to my esteemed guests. <laughs> and I am out of breath now, so. <laughs> but, uh, but let's talk about home ownership today. We are talking about um, something that is so critical to the Latino community. It is where, where cu culture in intersects. It's where family is formed, it is where we nurture, where we house, but where we build wealth. And so 
let's talk about what data is out there. I laid out where we are, 48.4% uh, home ownership rate. Laura, can you tell us about any additional data that's been out there that kind of paints a picture of where Latinos are on their home ownership journey today? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, and at first I want to start by, by thanking, of course, CHCI for inviting me to be part of this panel. And I also have to thank NARREP for the really amazing report that most of my friends have in their <laughs> hands. If you don't have it, it's available online to I download. I have my purse if you guys Yeah, have and so you, 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 you heard, you know, the, the overview, which paints a really comprehensive picture of what both kind of the quantitative as well as some of the qualitative factors facing Latinos, you know, on their road toward, toward home ownership. Um, the one thing you know, that I would want to underscore a little bit is, is to, and I know we'll talk more about this during our time together, but really talking about the, the inventory crisis. Yeah. And so earlier this week, actually yesterday, hopefully you all saw that the White House issued an action plan to address housing affordability and specifically um, the inventory crisis that we're facing in so many markets and particularly for entry level starter homes or first time and first generation home buyers. Um, I think it's, you know, this has been something that people have been talking about for a while, beating the drum, but in terms of the broader recognition, I really appreciate that it is getting the attention it's getting, not just the fact that it is a crisis, but also that there are so many factors at play. And if you look at the action plan, it talks about, you know, of course, um, you know, federal financing, supply chain challenges, you know, mm -hmm. new technologies for development, also um, issues around competition between families and institutional investors, there's a mm -hmm. lot at play here. Um, but I, I think the one thing I would like to underscore is, you know, we definitely need to do more work at looking at how the Latino markets are facing each of those challenges in the supply shortage, but also recognizing that when we're talking about inventory, there's the national picture, but there's also the local picture. And there are also a lot of markets where there, there is opportunity. Um, NAREP's report talks about this, identifying places where there is um, strong median income by Latinos aligned with the medium housing prices. So I think we just collectively need to be able to do both things and be yeah. able to help the markets where there is a lot of opportunity, um, make those connections, and then address the really big challenge that are facing so many of our um, communities in terms of the inventory piece. I would just want to make sure that we underscore the challenge of inventory in the discussion. Yeah. I mean, we outline in the report that that is by far the number one barrier Latinos mm -hmm. are facing right now on their road toward wealth creation or home ownership. So very good news from the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to see how it unfolds mm -hmm. uh, and, and hopefully we can address some of these critical issues. But Brian, you guys, were, you guys released a report not too long ago to talk about the compounding problem of, of affordability. Uh, talk to us about what you guys found, particularly when it comes to the Latino community. Sure. Well, first of all, I also underscore this is a great report. And um, <laughs> we have been uh, mining this data and uh, you know, producing several reports that look at home ownership, uh, home buying, and home selling um, by race. And uh, believe it or not, there are a lot of people out there who push back and ask why we do this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, everyone in this room knows, and um, I think we've really underscored that if we want to see growth in the housing market, it's going to come from people of color yeah. and um, probably disproportionately from uh, the Latino population, which is you know which has been responsible for the growth. Um, for the last uh, decade or more. So um, our entire economy really depends on understanding these trends and promoting more home ownership uh, among people of color. In fact, that's where um, the growth has to come from. When you look yeah. at you know, where, where the white home ownership rate is, we're not gonna have 100% home ownership among the white population. So it might go up maybe five, you know, maybe 10%. But when you consider how much farther uh, uh, groups of color have to come, it's all going to come really very much from there. So, <clears throat> so we have to look at, the, at that data. We've done a number of reports. The one report that you referenced is a report called Double Trouble, uh, which kind of states the obvious that we have record low inventory, uh, which is producing record high prices. Um, we, in that report, also look at affordability by race mm -hmm. um, and by geography to sort of identify 
what places are affordable and which ones, which ones aren't. But I mean, the, the, the real bottom line finding is that uh, for more than half of the homes in this country, you would have to have uh, uh, an income of 100,000 or more, a yeah. household income of 100,000 or more, and uh, the majority of Americans don't. Uh, and it's uh, even lower for uh, Latinos and, and African Americans. So, so much of the housing out there is, is unaffordable, um, and it's because, uh, principally because of inventory. Yeah. Uh, I know we're gonna talk more about inventory, but one thing you know, I wanna stress is this, um, the White House uh, plan uh, acknowledges that one of the problems we have uh, you know, in building is uh, zoning and land use restrictions. Mm -hmm. And uh, historically, zoning and land use restrictions uh, have prohibited or prevented uh, many people of color from living in different communities. Um, and we know that if we didn't have all of these restrictions, uh, you could build more housing, you could build housing that's more affordable to a broader range of people, and it would create more diversity. Uh, I think sooner or later, and we may be there now, more Americans are going to recognize that we, are gonna, we need a mix of housing types in our communities. Uh, you know, if people want to see the next generation of, of folks be able to live in these communities, that's going to become necessary. Um, but also, if we want workforce housing in communities, uh, we're, we're going to have to do that. So we're going to have to find a way to do all of it. This uh, inventory crisis is affecting everybody, yeah. but uh, it's going to certainly inhibit the growth of our uh, housing and our economy, which must come from people of color. Absolutely, I mean, I, I can't underscore that enough. I mean, if you look ge geographically at Latinos, where they're located or where they're concentrated in, it's the markets that have the most acute host housing shortages. And so the issue of affordability is probably the most pronounced among the Latino community mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. any other community in the nation. Mm -hmm. So with that said, you know, whenever we've all talked about housing and home ownership, uh, you know, we want to break it down and it's simple economics, right? There is supply and demand. Most conversations around increasing the home ownership rate for communities of color have always revolved around housing finance and it's always on the demand side. So there are currently 8.3 million Latinos that are considered mortgage ready, that have the credit characteristics to buy a home today, but we have a housing shortage. <laughs> so uh, there is uh, a lot that can be done still on the demand side, uh, particularly because there's still, uh, you know, there are nuances to the Latino communities that the lending world doesn't um, address well, that we still need to work on collectively. Uh, but I would say that the majority of the efforts at the moment have to be on the supply side. But let's talk about the Latino community. The Latino community tends to be more likely to be self-employed, have higher debt to income ratios, live in multi-generational households. Uh, Rod, Rod or Eileen, can one of you talk about, let's talk about what we can do or how does, how does the housing finance world or lending impact communities where these are the characteristics of these communities? Well, I, you know, I think the first thing is for anyone who's, especially let's say in those situations of self-employed or you know, mm -hmm. multiple different jobs um, and you're a new home buyer, look, seek out home buyer ed and counseling. I, I think one thing that happens is folks go and they have maybe the, a non-traditional situation and it's frustrating because they might not have all their paperwork or everything else together and it can be really discouraging. So I think, I think this is, would be good no matter what your income level, trust us, you know, buying a home is for the vast, vast majority of us the biggest thing we're ever gonna do. Yeah. So, but especially if you're kind of facing that and thinking about how, how do I qualify given that kind of information. So I think that's the first. Um, you know, there, we are seeing some breakthroughs in, um, alternative underwriting mm -hmm. uh, through our philanthropy we're supporting kind of two different pilots that are doing that one is called underwriting for good that's looking at not just rent but utilities and other ways of of thinking about that so i think that's really important for yeah. you know the non-traditional customer um and then um you know just um i think the the multi-generational piece i think is the is so important and one that it we is. haven't quite figured out because yeah. if someone's not on the mortgage, how do you count that income? And 
how does that tie in? But even there, I think there are ways we could think about getting more creative in how we structure the home or you know, count that kind of you know, rental support or something that we haven't. So I think there's tons of opportunity for, yeah. for breakthrough, but I do feel good that there's more and more um, incentive and pressure to, and, and actually change, like of starting to count uh, rent in certain yeah. situations. And, and, and to give context to everybody in the room, you know, why this matters is that, you know, when it comes to underwriting a loan, it is much easier to underwrite a loan that's a simple W-2 loan. So if you have um, gig economy uh, income or you're self-employed, it's much more difficult to underwrite that loan, which makes it more difficult for an individual to receive a loan. So that's the pain point number one. And Latinos are crafty. We've increased our home ownership rate because of the resilience of the Latino community, despite policies, to be quite honest with you. And so as housing affordability increases, people are pulling money together. It's the tias and the tios and the abuelas come together to, to join forces in order to be able to qualify for that home and have an affordable monthly payment. But Rod, what, what else can we do on the demand side? You just said something that's very important, both of you did. I mm -hmm. think you brought up the point that we finally have the creation of more creative uh, approaches to yeah. financing. Um, this group and our group of advocates, we know this. By the way, this is the best group of advocates you will find in Washington, <laughs> D.C., bar none. The, it, let, me, let me say that currently, as we speak right now, we are traversing perhaps the most important reforms in mortgage finance in the past two decades. It's happening right now as we speak, all right? So it's not necessarily about more laws. It's mm -hmm. not about more regulations, more tax breaks or anything. Right now as we speak, there is a law called the ability to repay rule that is being reformed and basically we're taking out a lot of the details. It used to be that you were stuck at 43% DTI. You had to verify income for two years. Verify income for two years. You had to have paper in order to prove your income. You just talked about the tios and the tias that are working, how we do this as a family. Esa es nuestra cultura. That's what we do. Everyone, where everyone is contributing, right? What, what, that, it, this, this, the, 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 the legal setting that we had did not allow for this type of financing. Finally, what we're seeing is last year and into this year, we're seeing a process that will put us into a looser, safe, let me stress, safe. However, in terms of having to verify income, in terms of having to go to 43% debt to income levels, in terms of having to have two years worth of documentation, et cetera, et cetera, all of this stuff is sort of say it's, it's being relaxed. So we're going to start seeing some of the, the, the better financial institutions say, well, we can take more risks. We can perhaps mix underwriting that we didn't do before. This is happening right now. Please understand that the other element is also FHA. And FHA lending that is so important to our communities is the, the liabilities are being um, fixed on that side. So that's happening. This is of huge importance. I beg anyone that, that, that cares about housing to sort of keep a focus on this. But let me just bring up one other thing that, that hasn't been brought up now in terms of affordability. You did talk about prices of, of homes going up. Oh, yeah. You did talk about um, uh, some of the other, the, the, the one thing that, that, that is being left out is interest rates are going up. Interest rates shooting up and inflation going up. Both, both of those things together are a killer. I'll tell you that our analysis by some of our bankers, and we haven't done this officially, but talking to a lot of our bankers are doing this analysis. They're telling us that, that a family today, and this is not only Hispanics, probably Hispanics and blacks are suffering more, but generally across America today, we can afford about 65% of the home that we did two or three years ago. Mm. That's huge. And so you mix that in with the increase in price, and, and, and this is only because of inflation, going up. We have to spend more just to eat, yeah. right? So that's an important element that I think we should throw in here and it, it, it leads to policy discussions that matter. And I think it's important to level set. What, what, what Rod said is extremely important because prior to the Great Recession that happened in 2008, 2009, our community was hard hit. The Latino community was disproportionately hit by, by 
loose lending, uh, <laughs> like Rod said earlier, uh, but a deregulation when it came to, to housing finance. And so that meant there was a lot of subprime lending that was happening in the Latino community. Uh, my family's from the Inland Empire in California, which is ground zero for, for what happened during that time. Inland Empire, Nevada, places in the Midwest. But that meant that Latinos lost two thirds of their household wealth during that time. So uh, Dodd-Frank came in and there was regulations that came in, created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And the challenge has been, how do we ensure that there's consumer protection, but at the same time, we don't restrict credit so much that communities of color aren't able to start on their home ownership journey. So that's the magic wand. That's what, what Rod was talking about. That's why it's so important that we get that right. And it's always that magic, that magic center. But you talk about FHA, which in today's affordability crisis is critical because Latinos are twice as likely to obtain their first home through FHA. Why is it such a problem right now, Nora? Yeah, no, it, it's a really big point. So, you know, we know the history of, you know, lower home ownership rates in the Latino community. What that's resulted in is we have a less generational wealth. And so when you have individuals and families going to buy their first home, our community is more likely to need a low down payment product. Mm -hmm. Housing is expensive. We don't have the generational wealth to be a pool or a parent or a family relative who can give us $50,000 mm -hmm. for that down payment. And so we really rely on, da on low down payment. And the, the, the main product for that is FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, offers a 3% down payment product, which is great. That's the good news, right? Because you know the more conventional, traditional loan without private mortgage insurance, you have to put 20% down. That's a big mm -hmm. difference. So that's the really great news is there is a product out there for a low down payment loan to allow people to get into the home. The challenge is that in today's environment, mm -hmm. where you have the shortage of housing, you have a lot of competition, prices are going up, the FHA product it's not a very um, it's not a very flexible product, and so it, it makes our families much less competitive when they're bidding on a house that's also being bid on by an institutional investor, someone with deep pockets who's buying, making all cash offers, waiving all contingencies, sight unseen. They're just buying a property to add to a big portfolio to hold for the long term as a rental property. That means that home is being taken away from a family who is relying on FHA financing. So it really makes them very uncompetitive in today's market. Um, and so we need to find ways that we can do both things, so we can help families enter into home ownership with a low down payment, but also be competitive in today's environment. We need to, we need to give them a let up. Right now, the, the, the level of competition is not fair. And the problem is that conventional loans, Latinos are, our report found that are 80% more likely to get denied a conventional loan. So these are the Fannie and Freddie loans um, slightly higher down payment, mm -hmm. um, higher uh, credit score requirements, lower debt to income ratio requirements. Now, debt to income ratio, let's get to that. That's the number one reason why folks get denied conventional loans. Let's talk about student loans. Anybody want to talk about student loans and how that impacts debt to income ratio? <laughs> it's a huge problem, and I think, um, you know, your debt to income means somebody's looking and saying, here's how much you have to pay every month before you pay that mortgage payment, mm -hmm. right? And the higher that is, the le more likely you're not gonna be able to pay your mortgage payment. Yeah. And in the last 20 years, student loan is, you know, the yeah. main culprit that has just raised that um, really high for people for many years. So I think, um, you know, Illinois, la I guess it was last year, they had a, a program where the state appropriated money uh, yeah. to forgive some of the student loans if you were buying a you know, first-time home buyer. But we haven't seen that many uh, examples of that. But somehow, this is like another area we all have to figure out how we innovate because it's not doing anyone any good to say, <laughs> you did what you were supposed to do, you got educated, and now you're stuck. Yeah. So, yeah. And, um, and if, I, if I could add on that, I mean, that's uh, particularly acute for, for people of color because if you haven't had historical family wealth, uh, you're finding you know, the money to afford uh, a home through higher salary. So uh, people of color are going to graduate school yeah. and incurring more student loan debt, which is helping them on one hand get the income, but then they're not qualifying for the yeah. loan because yeah. of the student loan debt. Not to mention the, the fact that it begins to wreck 
you know, other aspects of your credit mm -hmm. that you have all, all of this debt. Yeah. Um, so um, we need to find innovative solutions. Uh, I think we're going to be forced to find some solutions. Yeah. Obviously, lots of debate about that. But uh, yeah, it's front and center, center yeah. and we've had some forums uh, at NAR to focus attention if, on if this. If I could add on the piece around generational wealth and reasons for why our community is more likely to need student loans, another flip side of that is also just our country right now does a really poor job of financial literacy and education. And so particularly if you're you know, first generation college, your parents didn't go to college, you're not going to have... Um, you know, the, the, the trusted guidance about how to do it, how to pay for it. And, you know, in those, you get into college, that's so exciting and you're fulfilling, like, you know, probably a dream of your parents and grandparents. And, you know, no one tells you, you know, how, you know, about the whole payment part and you go and you get all this paperwork and, you know, you're 18 years old, you never signed anything before, and you're asked to sign on the dotted line. And a lot of folks don't really understand the implications the consequences of the loans, are there alter better alternatives? Um, and we just did a really poor job in that, you know, it, it's, it sets people on a path that they don't necessarily recognize or appreciate until many years later when they want to buy a house, you know? The other concern is blacks and Latinos are also uh, twice as likely to be tapping into their retirement and pensions oh, yeah. in order to find money. I think that's the lowest rate of retirement account participation, yeah. period. Yeah. So that's so. But I'm going to interrupt you all <laughs> mm -hmm. because guess what? We've actually made some progress here. Latinos are actually more mortgage ready than ever. Mm -hmm. So there are the, the amount of Latinos that are considered mortgage ready has doubled since 2015. So what's happened is that Latinos got their good grades. They <laughs> um, got their AP classes. They, they, you know, they're ready. They're, they're ready to become homeowners. There's a lot of them that are ready but there's not enough spots, right? There aren't enough homes. And in today's America, that is the number one issue that we are facing. So what happened? <laughs> Brian, do you want to talk? We, we to, didn't give us, build give us, enough. Give us a quick history. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we so short on housing? Uh, well, what yeah, uh, we, we, we haven't built. And Who we're, do we blame this we're, on? We're, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're, we estimated it's not here. <laughs> we put out a report last year called Housing is Critical Infrastructure, where yeah. we estimated that, that we are about 5.5 million units short of where we need to be, uh, which may take us more than a decade to build out of. Um, and I mentioned, you know, zoning and land use restrictions. Yeah. That has uh, raised the cost to build. And so uh, when you do see building, um, it's not the mix of housing types that we need. So that everyone, um, you know, has has an appropriate place. One of the things that we're pushing at the National Association of Realtors are efforts to use uh, to, to find ways to repurpose existing structures. Yeah. So, for example, we have a lot of commercial space in this country that's underutilized or not used at all. We have vacant malls. We have uh, uh, hotels. We have even schools that that are are not used. Um, so. The federal government can help by promoting tax credits to help those uh, developers convert those, and that may help us sooner than some of the construction that we need. Um, we've also talked about you know, whether we can give capital gains tax cuts to, um, to owners, like investor owners, who would sell to first-time home buyers. Now, that doesn't increase the overall housing stock, but it does put more um, investor-owned housing on the market for first-time home buyers or owner occupants. Yeah. So there are things like that we need to look at in addition to construction in order to make sure that we're we're creating a you know a line of, of housing yeah. out there. So there's zoning. Could, could I yeah. add a, yeah. a point? I, just, I, I, I love history. And you know, during the housing crisis years, I was at the Federal Housing Finance Agency, regulated Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I was sort of kind of ground zero in that regard of uh, housing policy, you know, I think it's important to remember it, in those years, you know, 2008 through, depending what you want to call it, 12, you know, 14, um, we had too much housing, you know, yeah. and, you know, they, in, in the, the industry really contracted and a lot of, you know, plumbers and electricians, a lot of the technical, they, you know, they retired and people weren't entering that business. So, you know, we really um, scaled back on that industry 
And so there was the underproduction for many, many, many years. And now that we're seeing a shortage, you know, it's not like a switch you can just flip no. like that. And yeah. so that's another. Yeah. So, so I think yeah. you more or less uh, indicated this, but you're saying skilled labor. Yeah. We have a skilled labor shortage, which hmm. also <laughs> uh, an issue. I wonder why. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But some of it is also like people being willing to, uh, all of us, to think differently about what does home ownership mean right. uh, from right. things like how do you think about condos and home ownership to Absolutely. how do you think about modular housing and mm -hmm. how do you think about you know homes that are a little closer together and maybe yeah. you don't have as big a yard. So there's it goes on both sides. Um, and and I think it's important, say, it's important to put in that this plan that came out from the administration, mm -hmm. this the problem itself is most likely local. And now we have the federal government coming in. I, I am very thankful that the federal government is finally recognizing and understanding that there is a need to take a sort of unified approach and sort of get every agency to come in and aim at, this, at the issues uh, so that we can do this holistically. Mm -hmm. But I think that we need to understand it is a local problem. There are, there are many local elements to this. Um, and this is going to just sort of flow down to a state on a, to a state by state uh, uh, conversation. The problem with that is that it is a local issue, but every local city points fingers at the other city because <laughs> NIMBYs or not in my backyard activists are so vocal in every one of their cities. So we ask that all of you go home, go to your city council meetings, speak up, and say you want to be homeowners, uh, and we need to build more homes and. That's what we need to do. We need some incentives nationally or statewide for cities yes. to actually reform their zoning yes. or actually uh, increase approvals for housing. Yeah. Uh, so lots that we have to do. I'm getting the time, uh, the time card and I uh, wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Yeah, gonna... oh. One more thing that I wanna make sure we cover and then we can go back to in the questions, but if there was one thing that we can do to increase the home ownership rate, what would it be? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a quick round robin. What do you think would be the single policy or market approach mm -hmm. that we can do to increase the home ownership rate? So start with you, Laura. If, if I could just do one, I would say immigration reform, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. labor to build more houses. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I still think tax incentives for uh, production. Mm -hmm. for conversion of existing property. Mm -hmm. Wow, how interesting that we're all so different. I would actually <laughs> Good, putting, it all. <laughs> yeah, zone, zoning and land use. I, you know, I think there's, yeah. there's, there's huge problems there. Yeah. And I would uh, figure out a way to free up as much land as possible. Yeah. There is a lot mm -hmm. of land that is controlled by institutions, whether that is government freeing up their own land, and there's plenty of that, or giving some kind of tax incentive mm -hmm. But the faster you can get that land freed up and get it under control, yeah. then you know if we fix the zoning but we never get control of the land, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But yeah, you know, one thing isn't going to really help it. But that's what yeah. I mean. <laughs> These are amazing, right. and I think we've all been working on figuring out what it is. What's the magic bullet? The issue is that it's not. And I am going to give the floor to <laughs> Congressman Vargas, who has been an absolute champion on the, this issue, by the way. So if you can. Well, Join us. Well, <laughs> Good timing. Well, hello, everyone. Hey. You guys don't waste any time at all, huh? No. <laughs> I like what you said. Put your head on the chopping block, Juan. <laughs> what a pleasure to be here. It really is. And I apologize for my tardiness. I know I was supposed to be here earlier. We literally just voted, and so I was able to, to get here. And I apologize again for those that, uh, if I delayed anything, I'm sorry about that. But I do appreciate very, very much the opportunity to be here. And I want to thank Norena. Thank you so much. I appreciate this again very much. Um, and thank you for having me today, as I said, to speak on such an important summit. Homeownership is a critical component of our nation's well-being and economic security. Homes serve as a cornerstone of every community and provide safe spaces for children to thrive, families to flourish, and small businesses to start. As you all know, rising prices and supply chain constraints are impacting Americans across the country and depriving first-time home buyers of affordable housing options. That is why it is 
crucial that public and private sector officials convene at events just like this to discuss and develop solutions to our nation's housing crisis. And again, thank you so much for doing this. In Congress, I am leading a bipartisan initiative to decrease barriers to home ownership for the first time Hispanic home buyers. And I'm encouraged as I stand here today to see that industry leaders and advocacy groups are working together towards the same end. I hope that we all leave this session with additional knowledge and tools to make own, owning a home an affordable reality for all Americans. At NAREP, I gave the story of my own situation at home. My mother and father are both from Mexico. They, my father came out of the old Bracero program and worked very, very hard. My mother uh, ironed dresses in San Diego, and we lived on a chicken farm. And we didn't own the chicken farm. We were laborers on the chicken farm. And we always dreamed of having a house, because we thought that that would be something that was very good for our family to stabilize it. Turns out it was not only very good, it was very, very good. That old house, <laughs> that old house put me through college yeah. and put nine of my other brothers and sisters through college. And that old house that my mom still lives in, that's it, had about 5,000 seconds, I think. <laughs> <laughs> She'd always have a second for 5,000, 10,000, depending on what we needed mm -hmm. to get us through. That old house now is helping some of my nieces and nephew buys home. My mom is one of the most generous people in the world. She takes equity out of the house to give them down payments. Now, we help a little bit, too. My, my kids are not quite at that uh, age yet. But I got to tell you, that old house really is what allowed us to create wealth. It allowed me to go to college and to, to ultimately to law school. But that old house meant so much to us, and it still does. And I appreciate very, very much all those that made it possible for my parents to buy that old house. And now we have to make sure that other people can buy that old house mm -hmm. because that is the way to grow wealth in this country. In our country, owning a home is so important, not only to stabilize your family, but to be able to, to grow your family through that and to see all the opportunities that you can get by being creative and being generous. So again, I thank all of you that are here. I know that that's what you're talking about, how to do it. And we have to, we've done a lot of good things. We need to do more. Um, and I tried through the uh, program that didn't go through this last time, but we're going to try again through the Build Back Better. But we've got to get more money um, for those first-time home buyers. It's so important to help them out to get them on their feet and get them into a house. And thank you for all that you do. We appreciate it very, very much. I'll be hanging out here. If you want any, you want to ask me any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. So we are going to open it up to questions. We have a couple of questions. I hope you that I'm going to ask them. If you don't ask any questions, <laughs> because we there are some questions that I didn't ask for the panel. But uh, who wants to be the first person to ask a question? I'll start. All right. So um, Laura and I have had this conversation a lot. And you know, we talked about the fact that Latinos are, are expected to account for 70% of new homeowners over the next 20 years. There is such an underrepresentation of Latinos when it comes to housing policy, mm -hmm. and especially homeownership policy. We need more Latinos in this space. We need more Latinos in, uh, in the housing organizations, more Latinos talking about this in Congress, more Latinos talking about this in uh, all ranks of the industry, from uh, you know, housing finance to home builders to everything. We need to ensure that we diversify this space. And so what do you think we can do in order to increase the number of folks that are talking about this and doing this work? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I, I want to start by just underscoring your point. I think this is so important. And for those of you interested in this topic, there was a study by the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas that just came out a couple of months ago that showed that if you are a person of color buying a home and your loan officer is also a person of color, not only are you more likely to be approved for that mortgage, but you're more likely to be successful in homeownership and not default and maintaining that homeownership. 
And that to me just demonstrates how important cultural competency in those connections are for, for entering to home ownership and maintaining home ownership. And so I'll just underscore that point. And there's the, the mortgage industry is a big, complex ecosystem. It's exciting. There's a lot of different things to do. So whether you are an executive at a bank designing what a mortgage product looks like, or you're a loan officer across the table from a family, or with a regulator, or lots of different things in between, there are a lot of opportunities. But I think at the end of the day, we need to hold you know our policymakers and our corporations accountable. Mm -hmm. Unidos, um, a couple years ago, together with CHCI and many of our other sister organizations here in DC, launched this initiative called Proyecto 20, Pro Project 20. And it was about when the new administration was coming in, we built a coalition to make sure that political appointees, that there was representation for the Latino community, and that it mirrored what the population is of the US. I think we need to do have a similar Proyecto 20 for corporate America, mm -hmm. and particularly financial services. So that's what I would want us to do. Mm -hmm. So if any of you are interested of going, in going into the space, please talk to us afterwards, because it's a lonely world. <laughs> <laughs> we need more voices out there. And Dardena, um, there was, um, there's a great program in California, the California Rural Housing Coalition has been mm -hmm. doing for more than 20 years. And um, it's, it was designed really for rural, but then expanded to some urban suburban. And it was trying to get people who were from communities uh, to join back to the communities. It has served about probably 95% to 98% people of color, mostly Latino. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great. It really uh, focuses on the Cal State system and opens up this opportunity for like a year-long internship, a summer internship, a lot of training, and a large chunk of those graduates stay in affordable housing or real estate. Um, so I think there is always that piece of people don't know it's an option. I was a you know first generation, and my dad was just like, we're going to help you get to college, and I want to make sure you're getting a job out. So saying, like, hey, I want to do this affordable housing thing, like, he never actually really understood what I did. Um, but so I think, um, especially for first-generation families, trying to make sure, like, hey, this is a great career. There are people who do finance in this. There are people who do law in this. There are people who do accounting and building. Um, so it's a little bit more on all of us to also try to get that message out. I will say, first of all, congratulations to CHCI, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we've done this well. And I say we because I'm part of the um, We have Fatima sitting here in the, uh, in the front row, and she is our, mm -hmm. our, you know, the, um, uh, our housing fellow this year. Mm -hmm. I think that this is something that does get young people into the policy side. When we talk about uh, getting people into the banks and into financial institutions, look, it's an easy proposition. If you bring in people from the community, you will make more loans in that community. And I think what we're seeing within the American Bankers Association is that um, uh, there's a lot of what they call accommodation staff, which means staff that understands the language of their community. Generally, this is, is likely to be Spanish, though not always. But these are people that share the culture. Now, we don't want to go back to certain practices of culture brokers that we had leading up to uh, the 2008 problem, right? But if we can, if, if we can do this correctly, educate, and uh, Anare, by the way, is a big champion of education, not only education of the customer, but education of the loan officer. Por Dios, you have to know what you're selling. This is fantastically complex, and you have to understand the consumer and then be able to lead that person into uh, different products that fit their needs, right? But what we're seeing is a lot, that is happening, and the message that we're putting out is, it's simple. Not only do you make good loans, but you will make more good loans if you can attract people that are from that particular community to be yeah. your salesmen and, and saleswomen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, diversity and, and representation uh, and hiring more Latinos isn't for everyone. But it is for anybody that wants to stay in business. <laughs> really is. So uh, this is a this is a critical uh, part of the equation. So anybody else have any questions for the panelists today? Yeah, Hi. we're gonna have the mic come over here. Hi, I'm Jocelyn. I work for Young Invincibles. Um, 
Laura, right? Uh, you mentioned uh, investors adding houses to their portfolio. So I wanted to ask a question about how to limit that or what could be done for okay. that so that we could have those for first time homeowners that tend to be like not as wealthy as investing firms. And that can be the congressman too, <laughs> like a question for them. Yes, that, that yeah, maybe the congressman solution. It's a, that's a really important question. I think right now there are a lot of people um, trying to identify opportunities. Certainly when we're talking about loans that are owned by the government, so like FHA, for example, I think there we have a little more power to create um, priorities so that the first offers have to come from either a family who's going to live in the home or a nonprofit, and we can build kind of that prioritization. Mm -hmm. um, in the private market, it, you know, it, it gets much more complex. This is a capitalist society, but thinking about, because um, the, there, I think that's what we need to do a little more thinking, because there are opportunities, but at the same time, we don't want to create um, things that, that displace or discourage um, renters from our community either. And so we have to balance those two things because there is also issues around rental housing. There's still a that shortage we, in, in rentals too. Well, because there's a shortage <laughs> overall of housing. So we yeah. need, again, I keep on going back, we need to be able to do both things. Um, and so certainly looking at solutions in, in local markets where families have a fighting chance to be able to compete. So maybe it's thinking about how to make their offers look a little more like the cash offers yeah. so that they can close faster. So whether that's reforming FHA to be a more competitive product, maybe it's Fannie and Freddie developing products, you know, or other or banks where that looks like a cash offer. So they, cause again, the buyer, they, they, want, they want a sure thing and they want to be fast. They want to get their money because then they got to go buy their next house or do whatever it is that they need to do with the money. So I understand that perspective on it. Um, yeah, I would just say there are some companies out there now yes. that are yeah. acting yes. that way. You, know, you always just worry about scams, though, right? <laughs> right, and right. What they're getting out of it, but they literally mm. are basically putting in the cat. They're basically going in and buying it and immediately transferring it. And obviously that's costing something. Right. That's, yeah. Um, the other thing is there uh, was an article recently about a home ownership association that kind of created this yeah. that, uh, be living that home in Virginia. for two years, trying to get to this investor piece. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as Laura mentioned, you still worry about all like the fair housing and other yeah. dynamics there, but that is definitely something that, uh, you know, whether they're good or bad, innovation tends to happen when we have yeah. these kind of things. Yeah. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Can I, yeah. can I just be a rebel and say to you, <laughs> go talk to those companies. I think a lot of those companies believe that they're actually doing a service. Yeah. What's happening is that you're getting to the sale, as Laura was saying, as you were saying, you're getting to the sales point. They're not selling to you because FHA may require an inspection and it has to be approved here and there's a fee that was missing and someone else had to come in. These companies are saying, okay, well, we'll give you the money now, buy the house and let's work out how we pay it back. Um, talk to them. And I, you know, I think we all probably need to step in and, 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 and see where are the failures in the home purchasing process that may be leading to these guys gaining ground. I, 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 I'm still in that research and I would yeah. you know, love to converse. They've been in all of our conferences, by the way. Norena, I talk to them in NAREB. <laughs> uh, with the realtors, mm -hmm. I've talked to them in my conferences at the American Bankers Association. They're open. I mean, they're telling you we are helping the low and moderate income people. And don't tell me no, because we're helping them get into homes. Wow, okay, I'm willing to have that conversation. And I think it's maybe one of I mean, those. I guess elements. I was just saying you have to, you know, there'll be folks who are coming with the right intentions and there'll be somebody right. who's scamming. Right. And right. so it's just always important as a consumer uh, or a potential home buyer that you do your research there. Right, I think That's, the biggest problem yes. is there isn't sufficient competition. And so I do think there is a failure in that, you know, uh, the mortgage-ready Latinos are not able to to buy those homes because mm -hmm. maybe you know there's uh, one not enough supply out there, and or some folks are just you know shy of being mortgage-ready. Um, yeah. So I think that you know the, the the housing production issue gives all of these companies, and not just companies, but I mean a lot of consumers who have lots of cash, uh, who are equity rich, um, they have you know a leg up. That's why we go back to a lot of the, the, the tax incentives again, that you, know, you can perhaps incentivize who owners sell to yeah. through the tax code. 
and I think it's important to understand who are the investors, right? And I think we're blind to that mm -hmm. issue, which makes yep. it really difficult to find mm -hmm. a, a public policy solution to go to Congressman Vargas and say, please do this. <laughs> Uh, but the problem is that there is foreign investors, there mm -hmm. are Wall Street investors, yeah. there's mom and pop investors. Yeah. I think you think of our family members who are able to, you know, to rent out their second home and, and that's the retirement account. Well, you don't really want to hurt those folks either, you know, so we need to make sure that, you know, especially folks mm -hmm. that are just starting to build wealth. So that is, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's really difficult to find a solution. Uh, especially like Laura said in a capitalist environment because the buyer I mean the seller is gonna want to sell it to whoever's gonna give them the most money and it's just it's hard to tell that seller that yeah. they can't do that and perhaps to put a stamp on this conversation let me just mm -hmm. say applause to the Biden housing plan that came out yesterday <laughs> it actually yeah. puts us on there right yeah. I'm not sure if they're coming up with the right solution but I think that this is when we're gonna need to talk to Congress and be able to understand what the problem is, as we're saying here. Yeah. But kudos that our policymakers are bringing, putting this on the table, and then allowing us to have that conversation. So. I have a question for me. I, I mean, I agree with everything that you said. <laughs> <laughs> there is a solution. Okay. And that is, you have to build more housing. You have to build more housing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. you have to Thank build you. more housing. Yeah. Yeah. That's an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a big issue. Um, I was on the San Diego City Council, I was the State Assembly, State Senate, it took me a long time to get here, and uh, <laughs> then the State Senate, and then I got here to Congress, so I kind of went up the ladder, and I can tell you at the local level, there's all sorts of rules and regulations that makes it very difficult and very lengthy to get a permit ultimately to build a house, especially if it's going to be um, something a little bit different than a single family detached house. Yeah. So it, it, it becomes complicated. Then at the state level, you go there and for California, you have the California Envir Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, mm -hmm. and you have to go through that. A good example of that was, it, it, it's sort of odd, Jerry Brown came to us when he was the mayor of Oakland and said basically he'd like to be excused from the law that he passed <laughs> <laughs> because he had redeveloped, he was redeveloping Oakland, mm -hmm. and this was an area he didn't believe he had to go through the whole CEQA process, but you know, they wanted a full EIR for this, and it was going to take a very long time. It added almost a year and a half and all sorts of cost. This is land that had already been, this is not pristine land. This was land where they had warehouses and other things, and he simply wanted to build housing there. There was no contamination, no issue involved with that aspect. So again, these are rules and regulations. State. Now, the state understands it, and so the locals. They're trying to remove some of these to speed it along. They're also trying to make it easier to densify, which makes a lot of sense. And then you have the neighbors oftentimes say, that's a great idea somewhere else. <laughs> you know, not in my neighborhood. I don't want all those Mexicans here. You know, put them somewhere else. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that's the way they say it, you know, because a lot of the people who are buying the houses are Latinos. And you know, we have to push back. And lastly, I'd say also our own personal individual choices. For example, all of us do want to have a single family detached house. Yeah. And yet, if you take a look at a place like Vienna, you know, I'm on foreign affairs, so I travel a lot. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, conventions there. Everybody likes to go there. Why? Uh, because it's a beautiful city, but it's dense. Yeah. It's dense. It's stacked. It's five, six story tall buildings and people like living there. You know, we have to think about that more on the West Coast. You could densify tremendously. LA, you know, LA could densify, you know, beautiful property there, but you know, we had a single family detached housing. And that densification is important. In my own district, and, and I own a historic home, we live in a historic home, but even I say, you know, a buddy of mine owns a historic home. It's about 800 square feet, so it's a really old one. And that's how big they were, by the way the turn of the last century. They were small, that's, that's how big houses were. That was an average house. He's got a 10,000 square foot lot with an 800 square foot home <laughs> and he can't tear it down because it's historic <laughs> and it's one block off the trolley. That doesn't make any sense at all. That, that property should have 20 units on it yeah, at least, absolutely. not one. And so anyway, we have to think about all that, but we need supply, we need to push, okay. They, mm -hmm. they gave me the... <laughs> 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 no, that was great, Congressman. I think uh, 
beyond everything we talk about, you know, the difficulty with FHA, uh, the difficulty with institutional investors, everything, the, the um, skyrocketing price appreciation, everything comes down to supply and it comes down to our severe underbuilding of homes. And, and Latinos want to have that single family home with the yard where they can play their music and have their family over. But we really, we're not gonna fill the shortage by building, uh, it, 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 if we want affordable entry level housing, we're not gonna fill the shortage by building those types of homes. So we gotta start our wealth building journey through a condo, through a town home. Uh, and, and that is an education within our mm -hmm. own community as yeah. well that we need to do. Any other questions? Yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just recently went through a home buying process now. Um, and did you close? I did. Congratulations. Congratulations. Wow. <laughs> um, and a lot of my friends are mortgage ready. Like for sure they make more money than I do. Yeah. Um, but one of the biggest questions that comes up is like you had 20% um, to buy that home. Uh, and I said, no, like, and they're like, well, how did you do it? Um, and I said, oh, well, I did a conventional loan at 3%, got closing costs covered, got a, had a great agent, right? Um, but like, I think there's a lot of misconception and lack of education mm -hmm. of like, uh, I mean, it's not an easy process, right? But it's a doable process. And now, I mean, my mortgage is cheaper than what I was paying in rent, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what is the, yeah, I, yeah so what, what does it come down to as far as like, how do we educate the community who is mortgage ready so they can go out and pursue a home purchase? Now, housing counseling is key. In fact, uh, we did a series of focus groups and surveys. Uh, I spent my evenings uh, watching different groups of uh, Latino home buyers, Asian home buyers, African American home buyers, across the board, and white home buyers, across the board, uh, especially among people of color, a large percentage thought that they needed much more yeah. in, in order to, uh, to buy a home. And so um, we're taking that to inform some housing counseling. We're meeting with uh, the housing counseling office <coughs> at HUD to help them uh, target their counseling better. So there's a lot more that we can do in that area. Any others? Yeah, I will, you know, and it's not housing <coughs> counseling, mortgage counseling, absolutely key and crucial. Part of the problem we're having here is also we need to do it in their language, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, when you can have education happen in Spanish, so you don't have, you're not bringing your child in there to, uh, you know, translate for you when, mm -hmm. when people can sort of understand what's happening. Documents in Spanish, these are becoming much more prevalent now. Fannie and Freddie are engaged in a lot of translation of a lot of the documents, the FHA. Um, and I, you know, I will say to you that to the extent that we have anyone here in, you know, within, within this group that may work with populations, go to your local banks and ask them. Can you bring some education to our church? Can you bring some education to our community? They will do it gladly. They'll come in, get someone of, of high repute, and I'm sure that, that Wells may be there. Um, they will bring some of these uh, you know, formidable resources uh, to educate the community. But that, that's part of what I was talking about before. In many instances, we also have to educate our loan officers to make sure that they have all of the resources available to make that, bring it down from 20%. It may not be FHA. You have other options that may be available to portfolio lenders and others within, uh, within your community, but that's absolutely important. Well, time is up. I wanna reiterate um, all of the important topics that everybody, all my, uh, my friends here on the, on the panel and congressmen covered today is that, you know, home ownership is the single most critical asset probably a household can have uh, when it comes to the overall, I think overall as a Latino community, we're gonna gain power in this country politically, but also through bridging our wealth gap. And it's gonna happen through home ownership. So if we think about the fact that we're at the precipice of Latinos being the future of this country and Latinos really carrying the next couple of decades of the U.S. economy and home ownership being such a critical component of that, 
we need to ensure that we fix these problems and we need to ensure that our Latino community is united on this issue, that we're speaking up on this issue. And we have more Latinos and people of color that are speaking up in, in, our, in all of these organizations and uh, all levels of the organizations and in the private sector uh, championing this issue of home ownership. So I wanna thank my fellow panelists for all of the important points that all of you brought up. I look forward to continuing working with all of you and speaking to you often. Uh, and please come up to us afterwards if you have any questions or how we can all work together to solve these issues collectively. So thank you so much.